doesn't matter how many times I do this. The yeah. countdown makes me nervous. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I used to have yeah. yeah every I used to have a <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's funny is our delay isn't as bad as I'm thinking it is. So I keep like mm -hmm. interrupting you. Sorry about that. What were you gonna say? Yeah, you're good. Um, so I used to have a, a company I used to work for it, had a photo booth app on the iPad, and every time we would get it ready for people, they would be like expecting the photos right away, but it'd be like it would say three, two, one, and then it'd make a huge noise, and it did that each time. They're like, no one was ever ready for it. it <sighs> Interesting. Made you frantic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, actually, those can be some of the best pictures at a photo booth. I remember oh, before yeah. the, the rise of all the like auto versions that exist now, I would often have either myself or I would hire like a second shooter or whatever to operate the photo booth. And when I would trick people in the countdown, be like three, two, blip, <laughs> like those were always the funnier photos than when the ones they, yeah. were, they were expecting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you said you you do a lot of live uh, streaming yourself. Anything in in particular? Anything? Uh... Yeah. So so I work for a church, and so we live stream all the time. So I'm always fixing broken stream codes and dealing with Facebook crashing at the worst times. Or like last week, YouTube was down for no reason for I like saw that yeah. six hours. Yeah. I'm starting yeah. to wonder what's going on. That Apple also had some sort of internet related outage. It seemed to be where it was for whatever reason, slowing everybody's actual OS down. It was trying to phone yeah. home to do some kind of something and it couldn't, it was, it was breaking the actual OS, which I thought was very bizarre. Yeah. I thought, uh, I thought it was because everyone was trying to download big Sur, but I mean, yeah, even my phone was slowed down for a while. Yeah. It, it was probably something related to that. I am waiting for the day that something finally legit takes out like the internet for an hour. <laughs> And everybody, like the yeah. entirety. I mean, there's enough redundancy that that I don't think that could ever happen unless like an EMP. Yeah. You know, I, there, are, do you ever? There was. Do you are you ever worried about an EMP taking out all electronics in like a region? Uh, yeah. I mean, I live in I live in pretty close to Austin, so it, I mean, if anyone, someone would probably make a dirty EMP in their backyard down here. <laughs> that, that's true. Um, yeah. There was earlier this year. There was like a major DDoS attack on. Um, the U S and I know like, yes, yeah. all like ton of servers. I think it was something related to cloud flares, something in their upper tier broke down, but it broke everything. Yeah. It seems that that would be uh, inevitable at some point. I, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's tough to think, but then I also wonder, well, how many, how many places are we doing that to other people? Like how many Americans or government agencies are actually attacking other oh, countries? Yeah. You know, it's like easy to, oh, yeah. like, oh my God, America's under attack uh, digitally. This is crazy. Everybody's after us, but like, hmm, I'm guessing we do a fair amount of it. Uh, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> output. I don't know. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting stuff. I would love to be behind the scenes of some of the the bigger tech companies to see what they do, uh, you know, realistically, to to fight and, yeah. and plan for this kind of stuff. I would want to be a fly on the wall. I wouldn't want to be in charge of anything no. when that happens. No, <laughs> no, yeah. Enough accidental things happen that you know there are like security holes uh, <clears throat> oh, that, yeah. that are bound to be exploited some at some point are you really into like tech or live streaming or did you just kind of know it better than everybody else at your church so that's your job now <laughs> uh it kind of it, it kind of started that way um i i was always more techy than i was anything else growing up and so like i used to take apart old computers and put them back together and try and figure out how hard i could run a system with the limited i remember i had a I think a dual core Pentium and 256 megabytes of RAM. And I was probably a sophomore. No, no, no. That's way earlier. I was in like sixth or seventh grade. And I remember trying to run emulators on that just for fun and things like that. So just, you know, trying to mess with things and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of fell into a job where I was going to be doing tech stuff for a church camp and then they're like also here's a camera um i was like mm. um and then so it kind of <laughs> yeah. i knew tech and so i figured out the camera and then i kind of knew video or how to video edit already and so it kind of spiraled into the job that i have now i'm at a different place than i started but yeah yeah it all kind of spiraled into that that's awesome i too had uh let's see this would have been almost 15 years ago i was the camp lifeguard 
And uh, <laughs> somehow, I guess I was enough into recording music and bands and stuff that they, they were like, hey, we want to put a CD, we want to sell a CD every week of the kids from that week singing our church songs or, or church camp songs to the parents when they pick them up so they get dropped off on sunday you know i'd record various like group songs and stuff throughout the week comp it to a cd and then parents could pick it up and buy it when they pick up their kids on on the end of the week or whatever friday it seemed like that would be easy like you know you have like uh, these certain parts of the day where you're consistently singing songs and blah 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 i could just show up a little recorder hit record i'll put that to a CD, but no, 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 no. It was the, I don't know why I got strapped with all this stuff because they started to, they, <laughs> they, they would do like slideshows of somebody who had uh, a camera throughout the entire week. And then slowly they mm -hmm. wanted to add the slideshow to the CD with the music as well. And this was every single week, an entirely new group of kids. Some could sing better than others. So they were like, just trend, <laughs> trend of the mic toward the yeah. counselors. But then it was like weird because some counselors would sing very loudly, very poorly because <laughs> they just, <laughs> you know, they didn't care or didn't yeah. know, and nobody had the, yeah. the didn't want to like break it to them. Like, hey, you should not be near the mic. Like, get get to the other side. So it became this huge dramatic oh, yeah. thing that I was caught in the middle of for some reason. And it's funny thinking back now. The the big part of every week was looking back on on the photo slideshow of all the campers, and I uh, I never once took a photo, even though now I'm a professional <laughs> photographer, and I had a good camera. Yeah. I literally never had any photo job there. It's just audio related. Mm. It's very strange. Yeah. yeah. How's uh? So you're in Texas. How's life over there? My sister's in Austin. So yeah. She's... So I live uh, I live between Austin and Waco actually. Um. What's in so, Waco? What is, could you give me a quick, like, other than what it's, <laughs> you know, the, the everything, the reason everybody knows it, what else is going on in Waco? Is it yeah. just a small town? So, yeah, uh, I, it used to be a small town, and then because of the silos, it really blew up. Um, Baylor University's there, um, which is probably the thing it was known for before then. Right now, it's kind of known for being in the middle of really, really bad construction on I-35. <laughs> No, that's exciting. But, um, you know, actually, speaking of which, I, I am glad that to see it appears that most states have woken up to the fact that, hey, this is a really good time this year in particular to push all these construction jobs because traffic is, mm -hmm. is you know, just by the consequence of everything going on, it's, you know, not nearly as bad. Like, I want them to be, if they have to be bad with traffic and oh, delays, yeah. do it now. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, they de they've made a lot of progress this year, but it it's still not nearly where you think it'd be for a project that's been going on for like twenty years, thirty years. I don't know. It's been going on for a while, but I yeah. mean, there's not really a whole lot in Waco. If I'm being honest, I I wouldn't want to live there myself. Uh, my next question was going to be okay. So you're sort of between them both. Would you recommend and choose somebody to move to Austin or Waco? It sounds like Austin would be the winner, but yeah, Austin's. I, I there's more to do in Austin, but I like living where I do now because there's enough variety where I can go to either one. But I'm not stuck in the traffic of either. Yeah, that's great, fantastic. That's sort of my situation yeah. in being closer to Baltimore. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm now removed, well removed from most of the DC traffic, unless I'm going to DC during rush hour. And it's, uh, it's nice because yeah, I'm just outside of that really saturated orbit that bleeds into Virginia more than it does Maryland. And, mm. um, uh, I like it. I like being out here. And I, but my fear is that again, given this year, a lot of people are going to migrate sort of out of the really densely populated areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's already happening in a lot of cities, New York and, uh, yeah. and other places. Yeah. That's kind of what's happened with Austin. Like Austin proper used to be booming and it still is. And a lot of people move to Austin, but because Austin's gotten so expensive, a lot of people end up moving into the suburbs and then the suburbs become expensive and then the suburbs just keep expanding. Yeah. Yeah. So you get that. What it, there's a little phrase for it. I can't remember. It's like suburban crawl, suburban expanse. Yeah, I, I think yeah, that, that sounds yeah, right. Yeah, where everything suddenly starts to look like California, which you know <laughs> it, it is infamous for its sprawl and and traffic. And I remember driving back from Palm Springs. It's like oh, it's a three hour drive from. I think it was Palm. No, no, no. It was uh, Joshua Tree, somewhere in that area. It's like a three hour drive to the airport. That'll be fine. And thankfully, I left like seven hours before my flight because it was like morning rush hour driving into the city. And it was the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life. I was like, I can't <laughs> believe. So I must have entered like the very tail end of where, because I was coming from the desert, you know, the very tail end of what would be like a daily r rush hour commute. And it was just 
the most miserable thing. I can see why Tesla was a company started there because people just want to hit autopilot <laughs> and check out mm -hmm. and not have to think yeah. about just being in like eight lanes of highway bumper to bumper traffic. Have you been actively shooting this year? Have you been busy with, with photography as well? Or what's your, yeah. sort of, what are your days filled with? Yeah. So, um, wedding photography is kind of a side hustle for me because I'm in school right now. Oh, nice. Um, it's yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a church job is my nine to five and the weddings pay for everything else kind of deal. Um, and so I've actually had, um, I only had one wedding postponed this year. I only had six on the books for this year, but I've second shot probably like 10 or 12 weddings this year. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of people got their schedules pushed back later into the year and I didn't have, but one or two weddings this fall. Um, and I'm, I've already finished those. And so most of my fall was open. And so, um, people have gotten sick or, uh, okay. you know, things change last minute. So I've, I'm just kind of centrally located and weekends just kind of work for me. So I'm pretty yeah, flexible in area, but yeah, I've been shooting all things considered quite a bit, but then also being in college, I've done several senior sessions, but not much right home about there. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever done a senior session. I should look into that. I think it's a very regional trend It's particularly more, I think more popular mm -hmm. in the South sort of Texas yeah. would fall into that for sure. Yeah. But not not really a thing here. I've also never marketed for it. But uh, yeah, it's been a, a weird year. I would say I'm very similar. And like the uh, some points, some weeks have been like busier than I ever imagined. And other points, I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to work next. And <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. yeah. But I'm really surprised people would still bother with a second shooter, just with trending smaller, uh, at least around my neck of the woods, uh, yeah. smaller uh, group sizes just, and I actively dissuade from second shooters to begin with. So maybe that's just my experience with it. But yeah. People. There's a, yeah, they definitely like late spring to mid summer are the weddings I was doing got a lot smaller. The numbers started to pick back up a little bit more. They're definitely not at the size they used to be, but venues open back up to 50, 60% capacity. And people were like, well, I'm dang sure going to have my wedding now then. And so gotcha. Yeah. People are, were trying to take advantage of that small little window in case things got back to where they are now. Cool. So weddings, it's your side hustle, huh? What are you going to school for? Mm -hmm. So I'm going for business. I'm studying finance right now. Ah, ah, super smart. If you know, back when I was in college, I really, I literally didn't understand what a, uh, MBA or even just like a major in business would was and she's like, that's mm -hmm. math. That's numbers. I mean, I, of course I was computer science, which is hilarious. Cause that's a lot of math, but yeah, but it was like <laughs> math in a way that I wasn't interested. And if I could choose any degree or, or track now, looking back, I 100% would have chosen business. Cause I didn't realize at the time how how many different opportunities that affords you. You're not, you know, you kind of, you can pick a niche or whatever, a focus, but like mm -hmm. you said, maybe finance would be considered that, but like you really can do so much with that. Make that choice in a heartbeat at this point. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you think you'll do weddings? Uh, do you want to do them full time as a photographer or would you prefer to? I would like to continue doing it on the side. I like my current nine to five and it's, it's a nice steady paycheck and I, I don't think I'm disciplined enough to do weddings full time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really market myself or do a whole lot of advertising. It's just kind of word of mouth and that whole that's kind of deal. That's how it starts, man. That's how it starts. Uh, that's, yeah. I mean, at least me and most of the other actual people that I know in this area, like personal friends and stuff that it starts word of mouth. And then you're like, holy crap, I need to quit my job. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. if, if your work I, is good. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'd, I'd definitely be down for like, a season here, a season there, like in between jobs to fall back on it. I like my nine to five because my nine to five right now is super flexible. I do a lot of video work for them. Cool. Um, so I, I'm kind of flexible, except of course, Sunday mornings, I have to work that, but yeah. it's kind of come and work when you want, just get the projects done. Nice. Very little micromanaging. It's, that's a very free flowing job. I, so I honestly really wonder like if the wedding industry won't be mostly made up of people sort of in your situation at some point, the photo industry, part of the, the wedding world, just because you can pick up 10 weddings a year and not 
be too overworked or feel like you need to quit your job unless you absolutely hate what you're doing, which doesn't sound like you do. You do. So I, I wonder mm-hmm. if it's not going to be most wedding photographers are, you know, they do again, like a dozen weddings in the year and that's it. They professionally full-time do something else. And it's just a good little side, side income. It wouldn't shock me at all if that, that ends up being the case. But then I wonder how, if couples care or would be, uh, you know, more comfortable with somebody who's like, this is all I do. I'm full-time professional. Yeah. But if you've got good work and you're like, here's some full galleries, you know, I shoot 10 a year. I am also an engineer on the side or whatever, whatever else, yeah. you know, I don't know that they would care. It's an interesting question, but yeah. 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 I think at a certain price point, people might care. That's true. Um, but I, I don't know outside of that. I, I've never had anyone ask me like when they're hiring me, if I do that full time or not, but that's true. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think if I have, but uh, is that also because it is very, um, it's presented as if you are like, you know, uh, like, I don't know. I would be surprised if, if in not just you, but anybody who does, who's just starting out or does it on the side, if they would put in their about me page, I'm also an engineer for such and such. So like, they probably leave that little bit out, but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. 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 But at the end of the day, that doesn't matter if your work is good. I mean, if I was doing something else other than photography full time and I was phasing out of my state in my career right now, yeah, it, it wouldn't matter. My work would be just as good either way. So I was reading through, how long have you been on, on my Patreon? It seems like a while. Sheesh. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's probably 2017, 2018. Yeah. It's been a Holy while. Holy crap. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just looking through some of your comments because the way I get them is notifications and email. They stack as like a giant thread. Did you? Oh gosh. Yeah. It's a lot. (laughs) We're we're not going to get that far back. I was actually looking at the more recent, uh, you were kind of, I think on the fence with, I feel like, I don't know, relative to when Sam Yang actually became like a well established company in the world. I feel like I may have even been late to, to the awareness of like, Oh, this is a lens company that exists. You know, I was always sort of like, it was either Canon or Sigma or Nikon or Sigma. And that was it. But I feel like we're getting all these other, uh, third party brands, Sam Yang for me, I was surprised. I think the 14 millimeter was my first Sam Yang lens and just thoroughly impressed with that thing. It's, uh, it's awesome. Did you end up picking up any yet either? You were thinking about, no, I haven't yet. Yeah, I'm thinking about the 14 and the 85. They'll probably be my next purchases. Um, I'm just going to wait for the new year to start because that's when my uh, weddings start back up. Okay, gotcha. The plan is to upgrade to dual R6s, but we'll, we'll see. But yeah, I I knew about Sam Yang, uh, or Broken as I knew them, as a brand. Um, I used to be really um, a hobbyist, like, wide field astrophotographer. Oh. Um, so I love going doing nightscapes and things like that. Um, eventually I want to get like my own rig and like start doing deep space stuff, but that's another side hobby for another time. <laughs> They're really well known in that sector because they make super affordable manual focus primes. So, like they have a 2414 for the EF for like 300, 400. And it's really, really sharp and really, it just does well on the edges for common and things like that. So that's how I found out about them, but I didn't know they made manual focus lenses. I'm actually on my Tamron 35 for my webcam right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks really good. I've been so lazy. Yeah. I just can't bring myself to set up a, <laughs> a webcam that's higher quality than my iMac camera, iMac Pro camera. Oh, I completely understand. I, I wasn't either. And then Canon dropped their um, uh, EOS webcam software like yeah. two days ago. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, well, I got a USB-C to USB-A cable. Might as well try it. And it works. So yeah. It's good. It's good uh, for sure. One thing that I'm very confused about with Rokinon versus Samyang. Samyang is the company, right? And is yeah. it is it is it accurate that Rokinon lenses are exactly the same, just with a different label on them, or are they subtly yeah. different? Yeah. Okay. Weird. Yeah, I think that uh, my understanding is they're all just rebranded as um, Samyang, Bauer, Rokinon. What is up with that? That's also happening I, with Godox and uh, Flashpoint and all these other branded yeah, flashes. Yeah. The prices are also a little bit different. My understanding about Godox and Flashpoint, though, is that Flashpoint is like Adorama's in-house rebranding for them. It is. Um, yeah. And so... 
but it's they the, charge a little bit more to warranty. Yes, the exact same thing. But, uh, yeah. You think it's a warranty differentiator? Like it's the exact same I, thing. So I, it's very even in the I, manual for Flashpoint yeah. stuff. It's like download the Godox app, and they're like, "What? Okay." Or it's like, <laughs> or download the Flashpoint. They just say either or. Like it is exactly the same product with just a different label. It's very bizarre. Yeah. I love both. I'm a big fan. Uh, it's great. Like the price points are half of what you know Pro Photo somebody would charge for a comparable oh, yeah. product, but. I just don't get what's happening there. Like why yeah. it's, I guess, cool for Adorama to be like, Hey, yeah, we, this is our brand of flash, but why I just don't get, cause they also sell Gothic stuff. Yeah. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I usually just search the brand name and figure out which everyone's cheaper and just buy exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Thing. But then yeah. it's like, you know, as time goes on and maybe some products, uh, Gothic's releases aren't carried over to the flashpoint. Like then you start getting differentiation and some of the details, you know, again, as time goes on, it seems to just really become unnecessarily confusing for just having the ability as Adorama to say, Hey, we have our own flash company, <laughs> I guess. It's yeah. Weird. I kind of makes me wonder if, uh, it's like, you could almost reach out to a company like, like the parent company, the the source of the manufacturing, and say like, "Hey, can I pay you, you know, X thousands of dollars and have you make my brand of Flash, Sam Heard, the Epic Flash, and itself?" Because it's like, well, okay, why not? Like, seriously, yeah. it wouldn't make any sense for the end user. Yeah. That's what's weird. Yeah, I don't, know. I don't care about flashes anyway, but I'm excited to see what direction, <laughs> what direction you go with. Uh, I do highly recommend yeah. the dual R6 setup. That's what I'm rolling with now, and it's it's so great. Yeah, I was curious about the R5, and then I saw the price point. I was like, I don't need 45 megapixels, and so the R6, that just seems like it'll be the best bet for me. If you do video as well, I think this is sort of my conclusion in the review, mm -hmm. I would go R5 just because it does have so much more uh, capacity in terms of its video mm -hmm. features and it's just got a wider palette of uh, you know, a wider range to choose from all the way up to 8k raw which is insane yeah uh, if you can work past uh the overheating literally or you know canon seems to be addressing <laughs> it uh, in software so yeah. but you know if you do a meaningful amount of video r5 does seem to be sort of a good choice r6 though if you're primarily photos i just can't see any other camera uh, right now in the market uh, as a better option personally, if you yeah. also want the RF mount uh, ecosystem. Yeah, I'm eventually going to, the plan is next year, probably midway through next year, to start doing hybrid coverage, photo and video coverage. I've started doing it in small samples. Um, there's a photographer that I second shoot for in San Antonio that I've partnered with her. If she books me as a second shooter um, and someone books her as well for a video package, I'll do the video package for them as well. So like, I'm, I'm doing in small samples, but not enough that to justify the R5 and I just don't want to deal with the potential of overheating on That's a the other day. thing. I'm, yeah, with the with yeah. a wedding day, if if it's primarily wedding videography, I still like the R5 mm -hmm. is a huge question mark because it is such a yeah. it doesn't do well under under that duration of shooting. It seems like you'd need yeah. a couple of them just as backup. And it's insane. I didn't hear like your review is the only one that I saw from everyone that even talked about like how bad the battery life was even in just still mode. I didn't see anyone else mention that. And that was what really pushed me away from the idea of the R5. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have seen anybody since or tried it eventually yourself, but it was just absolutely horrendous. I wanted the R5. The R6 was totally kind of off my radar. I thought it was an afterthought just to scoop up like a lower price point in the market from Canon mm -hmm. and that they were going to artificially, you know, hinder it in a way that just would not even come close to appealing to professionals. But uh, yeah, the R5, man, that battery life was just absolutely horrendous again they have pushed some firmware updates maybe i was also using an incredibly fast the 8k raw uh capable uh cf express card uh, so maybe yeah. that was creating some something to do with the bat some load on the battery that you know i don't know oh you got a little train going by you yeah i it's gonna get real loud in a second i live like a stone's throw away from train tracks that's cool Apologies, but yeah. How how does that affect uh, your life? <laughs> is that through the it night? Really, uh, it it is. If I'm already like, if I'm asleep, it won't wake me up. But if I'm trying to go to sleep, it'll it'll get a little bit much. But I'm I'm like right down the road from my university, and so our dorms are right beside it too. So I've gotten used to it over the last few years. Oh my gosh! Yeah, listen to that thing. We'll, yeah. we'll give it a second. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's insanely loud, and even in this room, it's pretty. It's not isolated, obviously, but it's 
it's not as loud as being downstairs, okay. where there's just like tile everywhere. Because upstairs there's carpet and stuff, so it pads it a little bit. But downstairs it can be deafening. It sounds like they're just messing with you. There's no consistency to it. They're just like random, mm-hmm. randomly. Is there? It must be a crosswalk or something around. But yeah, yeah it's okay. I've been there. I I also used to live near a train track about a year. And I was like, yeah. nope, I'm out of here because I was trying to record music. It's like it's yeah. the most frustrating thing in the world. Now I'm dealing with the opposite problem in my neighborhood. I'm again, a consequence of this year in COVID. It seems like I am now surrounded by dogs that people bought <laughs> because of having to stay at home and they wanted to adopt a puppy because of their kids and stuff. And, uh, and now all these dogs are being let into their backyards and they're like communicating with one another, barking back and forth. And it's like, it's just the most frustrating thing. I grew up with a ton of chihuahuas, so oh typical Hispanic, gosh. but like, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm over them. I'm so over them. Did you? Yeah, we have. You grew up in that area specifically? I, sorry if you're. Yeah, so I grew up, I grew up in the San Antonio area. So I did that, but we ended up uh, getting a cat about a month and a half ago. Not because of COVID, it just kind of happened. I'd been wanting a cat for a while since I moved out from home a few years ago. Just hadn't happened. And then all of a sudden, one weekend, it happened. Yeah, that's awesome. Cats are easy, they're the best. They really kind of run themselves, which I love. <laughs> I knew I liked you, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as long as I mean, my cat isn't at all like cuddly. Like it is, it is an exceptionally rare thing if she even comes up to my lap to like be pet. Mm. So I, I could go for a cuddlier cat, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> She's my my cat has two stages. She's either a crackhead running all over everywhere, huh. not giving you space, or she wants to curl up with you for five hours. There is not really an in between. So what do you uh, what do you? tend to do you have like any photo groups or people that you um connect with in your local market as far as yeah i guess you mentioned you shoot alongside kind of primary photographers are there any sort of you know i guess now it's sort of a uniquely it's a unique problem people aren't like meeting up in groups i would assume no workshops or anything like that but are there is the community there kind of uh supportive of one another as, as far as the photography side goes yeah, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of creative um, communities in Waco and Austin, especially with like rising tide groups and things like that. I'm not a part of most of those, but I did some online education through um, some photographers named Amy and Jordan, um, and they light and airy photographers. How my style started out, but I'm not there anymore. Good but they man. St- it's a good man right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they uh, they had all, a bunch of Facebook groups for their courses. And then we kind of branched off and started like local groups for different states. And uh, it just happened to be that I'm the most tech oriented photographer. So people always ask me for questions about like, what gear should I buy? How do I recover my files or, you know, things like that. And so it kind of established me as an authority in like this market. We have a lot of intercommunication and things like that. So mostly going up and down 35 and uh, in Texas, I have a, a lot of um, connections that I've helped put on a couple workshops for things, cool. but not in a while. Yeah, it's funny to me how prevalent that light and airy look is still and continues to be. It's just such a, it's a great look. Like I, there, there's nothing wrong with it. And, you know, there's clearly a demand for it from the client side of things, but I'm just shocked at how many photographers are battling it out in that space. It, it seems like you would see more of a push, you know, every two or three years into other looks. I mean, I guess you get like the dark and moody, which is the polar opposite of that, but there's like (laughs) nothing in between really other than what I think Mm -hmm. I'm trying to push and a few other photographers, but it's such the the rarity. But I, I don't think photographers, at least maybe in the beginning, understand that as soon as you go light and airy or dark and moody, you are now fighting out, uh, potential clients based almost solely on, price and whether they like your personality or not like because your work is just i don't want to say a dime a dozen but it's so cross uh compatible with so many other photographers that have the exact same type of vibe Mm -hmm. it's crazy to me Uh, and i think legitimately if clients were aware of the the vast array of what could be an edit on a photo they would choose i don't know other things more often <laughs> but anyway yeah. yeah i could rant all day long about light and airy but <laughs> mm. it all stems from i think the yeah the film days of shooting and, and the different film stocks yeah. that, you know jose via and such sort of set as the mm-hmm. the trend that really kicked things off in like 2008 something like that 2007 maybe yeah. but i just can't believe it how 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 long it stuck around 
Uh, and I guess Rising Tide, though, if I'm remembering correctly, is there like a founder of that organization? Is there a name? Uh, I think I thought it was Justin, uh, Justin and Mary Morantz, but I think they may just be one of the more like prominent voices in that group. But I'm not 100 percent sure. OK, uh, yeah, I have heard the name Natalie Frank, who's local to my market. Yeah. But then I yeah. also hear her name in other places, and I'm starting to become more and more convinced that people and I don't know what's accurate or not. So I'm just pure guesswork here because I'm not active in any of these groups either. I'm starting to think that people just do become really, really prominent in certain groups. And then somehow after given enough time, people just think that they are one of the, you know, originating founders or whatever, even if they are or aren't. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how often the actual person that started an idea or, or an organization actually gets separated enough that they're no longer even relevant and just nobody cares or realizes i'm sure that happens all the time yeah but. yeah like when i first discovered prisoning i didn't know that it was you mm -hmm. i was just looking for other you know ways to do do it photos and then i'm so grateful know. for google and the, the fact that my <laughs> you know google does seem to value highly in terms of seo age first more than anything uh depending on the topic and what it is but you know the fact that i was able to get a blog post written about it back in like 2011 or whatever means in theory i should almost always be like top of top of the uh the cast there when you get search results back but that's only if you go hunting for you know more details about prisming in general so enough companies now have launched uh like prism add-on products and stuff like that that it's mm -hmm. very disconnected from me and a lot of people way more established and famous than me are kind of known for it simply because they have a larger audience and that that's fine i mean that's bound to happen with any idea uh ring of fire i'm actually shocked i haven't seen somebody try and sell those as a discrete product of like i'm sure that'll happen eventually i remember so my early uh, years as a photographer was in a group called SWPB, which was like a Flickr discussion forum. And it stood for starting a wedding photography business. So that was where almost not all, most of the wedding photographers, I would say, uh, kind of concentrated on Flickr. And this one particular group had, uh, I don't know, just a really great I use the word curated, but it's not like there was a moderator saying who could or couldn't enter, but it was just a good collection of, um, uh, broad range of styles of people just starting out in the wedding industry. I remember like ty typing a, a, some comment or starting a thread about Prisming and people were like, yeah, I've never seen that. It's interesting. You should uh, write a blog post about it. And I'm again, really grateful that I did as early as I did because it's, uh, it took a while, but now it's, I, it's like, I can't not see a, f a reel or a TikTok without a freaking prism in it. that's also probably the algorithm probably slants toward me in a weird way but uh just like geez yeah. uh, even me though it's not like i was i think i more or less named it and established the specific size and shape being the prism that i use but you know people have there's a book actually from the 70s called prismatics and there's a photographer i forgot his actual name but he published this beautiful book that i own um i bought it somebody sent it to me after reading about priming. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. The guy actually had custom designed using a lens manufacturer in Germany. Uh, it was this element that could sit on top of any normal camera lens. And then it had a crank on it and you could spin it and it would have all these prism sort of glass elements within it that would completely randomize the look. So there was, wow. yeah, which was really exciting because he would always get something new every time you use it. But that was his take on using Prism-esque tools. Uh, but he literally somehow was able to get a, a lens manufacturer in Germany. And what's really neat, in the back of the book, there are schematics to have the lens made. I was like, I really want to, like, he just included them in, in, for whatever reason in the, after the index. I really want to try and send these plans off to some manufacturer and see if they could recreate it somehow. But again, different, slightly different name, Prismatics, and a totally different yeah. uh, approach, you know, having a company manufacturer mm -hmm. something custom for you, which seems kind of crazy. It seems like you would be able to more easily get a place to make you a lens now, given the, you know, the state mm -hmm. of technology. But yeah. I don't know how I would even begin to try and do that in a way that was reasonably affordable. I actually was going back through your old workshop videos and I picked up a couple of things. I'm actually going to, it's on my list to go pick up a, a pipe to do <laughs> ring of fire. Cause I haven't uh, that's a good done one. it yet. That's a good one. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that, and then I actually just picked up the little um little small glass mirrors that you recommended. Um, I actually just got those shipped in today. Nice. Yeah, it's mostly just um, reflections and prism work for now. Um, and even then, I, I really try to minimize it just because it does get played out and. Yeah, and it can happen in your own feed where you get people, well, you don't want to become so aligned with an expectation that A, clients expect you to do it every single time, because that's that's a danger mm -hmm. zone when every shoot or, or every wedding, they're like, yeah, we're, we're the prism photos. You didn't do any prism? Like that, I would hate to be forced into it every time I shoot. Mm -hmm. Because then you yeah. just you lose the inspiration for yourself and it closes the opportunity for other ideas that you might come across that you want to try more of. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, a reflection or a prism, it's good to diversify, in other words, kind of pepper in. That's where the ring of fire, it's a totally different look. It's still oh, yeah. you know, a lens effect, but it is just, it is, is a flare. It's not a reflection or any type of distortion to the actual scene. Yeah. Let me know. Maybe you can beat me to this, but I've been... I need to just 3D print it. I'm going to do this today. But I want to 3D print like a square, <laughs> sort, of, sort of like long rectangle, and see if I could get like mm -hmm. a square-shaped flare. So instead of like the circle mm. or like a triangle yeah. shape, because you can do that with bokeh. You know, if you shoot into, yeah, yeah. you can you like change the shape of the bokeh. Can you change the shape of a flare, and would it possibly look okay? <laughs> like I'm trying yeah, to imagine a square flare. Probably look totally yeah. bizarro. Yeah. I've never seen. There was an image you posted that I thought you had done like a, I don't remember where it was now. Um, but you had, it was, it wasn't quite an infinity reflection, but it was infinity a, symbol. a square in the, or go ahead. It was like a square in the middle of the frame and the couple was there and they were reflected on four sides. And I thought you had done something like that with like four mirrors put together, but it didn't like encompass the whole frame. So I was like, I couldn't figure out what was happening there. So I thought I, I thought about not quite Ring of Fire, but in other ways, I was like, well, what happens if you do, you know, with the little mirrors, what if you do more than three? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, thing to play around with, but I think you can reach a point where it looks so unnatural and disconnected to what people's mental model of a photo is supposed to look like that it just mm. doesn't doesn't work. But yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah. I, can't, I can't imagine which photo specifically that was. Uh, I have uh, I've used these things called wine pours, uh, which are just sort of like little pieces of circular plastic. And you can roll those up in a cylinder and it'll work very similar to, you know, aluminum pipe for the ring of fire. But if you keep it like partially unrolled, like in a U shape or you twist it, you can get more of like these infinity shaped flares, which are really cool. And since those are still hmm. sort of circular, uh, they, they do kind of tend to look more natural to, to a lens flare and it, it works really well. Okay. But I want to try a flare that has like a hard edge, like a cube or a square, or, yeah. um, you know, like a rectangle, whatever, a triangle. Did you ever try using any of the material? I, I don't remember if it was copper or brass that you used, but what, have you tried different like materials to see if it affects like the coloring of the flare? Oh, it totally affects coloring, yeah. Uh, more in the color range, I've, I've played around with uh, 3D printing different like silver, red, orange type of look. Uh, I tend to like something more red or silver personally. Like the copper thing was always a little bit too deeply orange and I didn't, I was, especially by the nature, with the nature of it, you generally have to be shooting with the sun lower on the horizon because you need that small harsh light coming right down the barrel of the tube, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be shooting up into the sky at noon because you can't really frame your couple yeah. uh yeah. <laughs> they're standing in front of you so uh, <laughs> so by the nature of that a lot of the flare tends to have a bit of a an orangey warm look anyway so i like the silver <laughs> so that it doesn't overwhelm the entire shot with orange if i want to add to that later i like that option but i don't like that being printed into the raw file like a super copper oh, orange okay. thing but what would be really fun to play around with is is multicolors. so it's it's easier to do it with light sources and some of my first examples i actually did get this to work you know you have a singular color of the pipe but you're maybe you have a a multi-light source um, off in the distance like a street lamp you know of one temperature and then a, a i don't know car light in another so maybe like more of a bluish and more of a tungsten and uh if those two light sources are coming through the barrel of the tube, you can get one flare, one circular flare, but it'll actually split into two different colors naturally in camera, mm. which is cool. 
But I wonder if you had a multicolored pipe, if you could take a singular light source and split the colors in the flare that way, which would be really exciting and uh, something hmm. worth trying if anybody out there hasn't yet. I have not. I haven't tried multicolored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you and uh, Ryan Brenizer got me started on the Brenizer method. And I, that's kind of one of my favorite go to things because it's one of those like you, like people are like, I can't get, you know, wide enough with my 85, whatever. I'm like, yes, you can. Totally. Like, I, yes. Yeah. I've taken family photos in a pinch where I'm just like, well, I'm going to make this a Boca Pano real quick just yeah. because I'm backed into a corner, like literally. And, and that's, yeah. hey, it worked. Yeah, I used to have to. I used to work for my university as well doing photography. I, photography has kept me employed on video one way or the other for the last few years. But I was doing a group photo for um, a graduate for a group of nursing students, and we had a couple hundred there. And I'm 100? at like wow. seventeen. Yeah. yeah, I'm at like se- at seventeen millimeters on my full frame camera. Or I think it was my five D Mark II at the time. That still wasn't wide enough, so I was like, "Okay, I know what to do." And so I just went and did it. Like, I mean, it wasn't quite a Boca Panoram, but it was just one of those, like, had I not had that experience, I wouldn't have, you know, thought to do it. And that, and then also I had another one, exact same scenario, except I was indoors and I had to do it all with flash. It blended surprisingly well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it could be those, surprisingly like, good or surprisingly awful, depending on kind oh, of yeah. where the, <laughs> the luck t- <laughs> falls for you. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it has got. I remember, yeah, one of my earlier weddings. They wanted to do just like everybody look at the camera for a group photo, and I was like, "What?" And I was not ready. <laughs> and it was a, oh, it was a DJ's tactic to get everybody like on the dance floor, to which actually is genius. Every DJ I think yeah. should do that. Like everybody in the dance floor for a group photo, you take the picture, then boom, you hit go, and people hopefully start dancing because they're already pre gathered. Yeah. But he you know the bride and the groom when you're taking five minutes to get this idea they're going to want to see that shot uh even though they didn't ask for it at any point from me the dj kind of forced my hand and i was not ready so i had a 14 millimeter (laughs) i was like this is as wide as i can go and i was you know getting the edges by doing a panorama again this wasn't to achieve the bokeh the shallow dip the field in the way that ryan would use it but it's basically just a panorama not just going yeah. side to side and it worked it worked great that happened to me at a wedding i was second shooting about a month ago the dj was like all right now everyone get to the dance floor we're gonna take a photo and my the lead shooter i had didn't have didn't have larger than the 35 and so we pushed everyone like deep into the room and she's she's like five three so she stood on top of the bar like in the far corner and like we just had to corral everyone and like it was probably like 12 rows deep it was this venue was not very wide. <laughs> is that a music stand behind you? I keep looking at it. Uh, yeah, that is. So my roommate does some um, public speaking sometimes. So, ah. it, uh, and he plays guitar as well. Um, I've got a, my keyboard behind me. I took a class like last fall. I enjoyed it and I bought a piano and then I've played it a lot less than I thought I would. But it's one of those <laughs> things I definitely yeah. want to get into. Cool. Especially I had all this time this year, but I definitely didn't do that. Um, but it's here when I get back to it. Hobbies are, are like that. It's hobbies and uh, what is it? Like organizational stuff. I'm convinced that the reason there are so many popular like home organizational shows is because everybody buys like the the cube organization system for your food or your clothes with just like, look how great and happy everybody is at the end of this show. But when they show up on your door, like the fundamental practice of putting something away in an organized manner is what matters here not just the the product that you buy <laughs> that enables it and uh same with hobbies yeah the keyboard and or any musical thing like you really do need to like force yourself uh, to like an hour a day which is really hard to, to find time for surprisingly hard you know yeah. Just yeah an hour but it's just like holy crap yeah i can't do this or or maybe you can if you really are committed but <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah i have a a daily reminder on my calendar 8 a.m to 9 a.m keyboard practice i've dismissed it every day for about six months now gotta get on that or <laughs> honestly you should just get yeah. rid of the reminder because i i have a sneaking suspicion yeah. i've been guilty of that as well with other things and eventually i found that the weight of starting a day or at least consistently at some point every day getting the notification and then swiping it away I, it, it was like I was failing, even though I wasn't. Like it just created this little bit of negative energy that was enough to, you know, once you add that up over six months, that's a lot of weight. That's like consistently, even if it lasts thirty seconds, this ah man, I really should be doing that, and then you 
move on and get over with it. But over six months, that can really start to like eat at you. And if you have enough of those little things in your life, uh, you know, three or four notifications every day, that's just a, a negative sort of energy. So I tend to, yeah, after three or four weeks of being bad about maybe a diet goal that I had at some point, or yeah, some house project that I've been meaning to get to, I just get rid of it completely. And I, I just assume that's, I'm done with it. I'm not, it, it maybe I'll get back to it some other day, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. If, if I, yeah, I had to kind of force myself to take a better control over my notifications in general, not just goals uh, for hobbies or tasks that I wanted to get done, but all notifications. I, I really tried to take a more proactive stance with mostly relating to social media this year. Whereas just like I'm muting everybody that I follow, I will only follow people that I actively remember that I want to see their work and keep up with them and see how they're doing. Yeah. And it's been a really freeing shift in, in my mindset this year. <laughs> yeah. I remember you posted that on Patreon. It was, I think you used like blue stacks or something like that. Yeah. Murga. I, it's called Murga. Yeah. It's still on my desktop. It's such a weird name. M U R G A. <laughs> yeah. It's a macro recorder. Yeah. And then I would use blue stacks as a, an Android emulator and Murga would open up Instagram and then like basically automatically take my mouse, click in a certain predetermined location and then go to the series that would ultimately right. uh, mute anybody that I followed in batch. So all 800 people I muted instead of me having to do that manually. Uh, you know, if these social media companies really at all cared about anything, they would give you the, the ability to batch, make batch changes like that. Like I want oh, to yeah. silence everybody. Just, I want to start from scratch, but you know, without like totally upending the networks you've built out, like I, you don't want to unfollow everyone, but yeah, I want to mute everyone and start over. Uh, that'd be great. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. You know, build those features out. I don't know why. Well, money is why, but yeah. Yeah, they, they definitely have, the, they know what they're after. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, you, software, the tools that are available to you, I'm super excited for the, uh, I don't know if you've looked into, do you use Apple products? Do you use Mac OS or? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, mm -hmm. the Apple Silicon, in theory, is gonna enable iPad apps to run natively oh, on yeah. Mac OS. And I'm curious mm -hmm. to see what kind of, you know, how you can exploit having an, a fully functional iPad app on your desktop that has tools like macros and mouse capable tools that you can do these pre-recorded actions and, you know, do stuff you're not supposed to, but in a way that hopefully gives you better yeah. uh, command over your own life in some way. Because <laughs> yeah. using blue stacks to run an Android emulator was still a little buggy and not ideal. I'm going to be curious to see where, where their product development goes. I mean, all the like, leaked bench results of the m1 chip are really interesting because you know it's like the best chip ever but it's also like okay like i i want to see like a second generation product i i like being an early adopter in some levels but not for something like you know my workstation or things like that that it's interesting especially when it relates to performance i have the macbook the one port uh, somebody coined it the yeah. MacBook adorable. I think that's a great word for it. <laughs> uh, it's the one port they discontinued it maybe a year ago, but that was a machine that I was shocked at what I could get away with performance wise, depending on, it seemed like whether it's sort of for GPU oriented sort of tasks, it was pathetic and did not keep up. But for other tasks, it seemed to do a shockingly good job. And it wasn't an Apple Silicon product, but it was a, I, I can't remember who made it. It was a mobile oriented processor that was a fanless design. So it was, yeah. I think the, the benchmarks of what you could push on that didn't line up appropriately with what real world experience was like if you yeah. you know knew where it had a strength and where it had its weakness like i like i said i was able to run uh, pre-rendered smart previews and standard previews on lightroom on that macbook adorable super fast like insanely fast as fast or maybe even yeah. faster than my freaking imac pro uh, but the actual rendering, it was pathetic. It would not do well. But once things were pre-rendered, the thing was would fly. And so anyway, I have a feeling the, the Apple Silicon is going to be uh, just a, an entirely, the Apple said, a new era of computing where we're going to have to realign. Like, okay, what is 20,000, you know, as a B, uh, Geekbench score readout actually mean if it's on yeah. Apple Silicon versus Intel's stuff or something? I don't know. Yeah.
it, it's yeah. an exciting time. But you're right. There's going to be a lot of, I think, compatibility issues. I personally believe this is going to be where Adobe takes Lightroom and says, okay, yeah, we're going to make Lightroom Apple Silicon compatible natively, but I think they're only going to do it to the non-classic version of Lightroom. Mm. I think that's where they're going to start to draw the wet, put the, put the wedge in. And if you use yeah. Lightroom Classic, which most professionals do, won't be recoded for Apple Silicon. That's my guess. I hope I'm wrong with that. But if, if over the next yeah. couple months, they only launch Lightroom for Apple Silicon as the Adobe Lightroom, the non-classic version. God, they really, I hate the naming that they came up with for that. But you know what I'm talking about? The desktop version that's yeah, basically yeah. like a mobile cloud yeah. version, but on desktop. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's like the mobile app. Yeah. So, yeah. They, so they released a statement saying that Lightroom CC will come out this year, um, but their plans are to do Photoshop in classic next oh, thank year. Thank God. Okay, so uh, yeah. I did not see that note. I'm I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm not going to hold my breath. I still would not be shocked if they're just yeah. like, eh, maybe next year. Yeah. But that's at least yeah. they've issued something formally. That's good. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. I'm waiting for them to, to do something to signal. <laughs> yeah, we're we're yeah. going to let classic die now. So I'm actually directing a directing and producing a conference for Baylor right now. Oh. Um, that's, that's what I was doing this morning. Um, I took my, my SSD up to my work computer to, um, render up the 10 hours of conference video. <laughs> so I'm just letting that fly. Um, it's finals week for me this week at the end of the week. So the nothing really exciting coming up, just end of semester kind of stuff that's cool. because of COVID. Yeah. Because of COVID, they, uh, pretty much started two weeks late and, we're ending like two weeks early. So we're not like breaking for Thanksgiving and coming back. So it's pretty much just been everything compressed in a semester, um, which has been interesting. Um, huh. So no days off and it's just straight. Wait, um, wait, so we'll wait, end. say so, that again. No days off. What do you mean by that? Yeah. I, well, I mean like no, like Labor Day weekend oh, or things like okay, that. Like, that makes like sense. we had, of course, like yeah. Saturday, Sundays, but like, I was not, like, did like, they take away your holidays. weekends? That's insane. <laughs> Holy crap. No. Um, it feels like it though, with the amount of work they give us, it feels like we're in our school. I don't know about other schools, but we have three options. You can either be, we have limited space in classes. So you, you got put in cohorts. So if you're in like, you know, finance 101, uh, and there's 30 people in there, they can take 10. You're in group A, B or C, and you go to class Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Um, and you're okay. that group. And then when you're not in class, you're, synchronous through zoom you have those two options you can either be synchronous all the time or if someone doesn't want to come all the time you can take their slots another day so that's mm. kind of how that works or you can be asynchronous which they post and upload recorded lectures um from the classroom um but because of that there it, there's, feels like there's a mental disconnect between how much work they're giving us versus how much work we can actually do it feels like because there's the like oh well you know you're not in class it, it, feels like they're giving us more work than they normally do in the semester um, to kind of like uh, compensate. For yeah, that. sure. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Have they, yeah. gosh, so much to think about and unpack. What year are you? Are you? So I'm a senior. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you, have they said anything about testing? Like how are tests being administered? Is it, are those only in person, like traditional style or? So some tests have to be in person. And so they're using our, um, one of our, um, commencement halls to do like a massive socially distanced, but like, you know, this group, these four classes are in the massive hall. Some of them are, they have an online, um, kind of like zoom. Um, it's called Proctor U. It's essentially a, uh, you get one-on-one -on -one with someone, um, and they watch your camera and they watch you and they can track like where your eyes are moving to see if you're cheating. And oh my like that. gosh. So yeah, it, it's pretty insane. That's kind of creeping me out. Um, I'm not going to lie. I don't like yeah. that. <laughs> Track yeah. your eyes. And so, whoa. Yeah. And so there's like a, you know, if you, you know, looked over this direction or, you know, your screen changed, you know, there was a noticeable change in your screen color or things like that. Um, they make you tilt your, your webcam around to show that you're not like having notes beside your things like that. Um, uh. So some, some exams are done that way. Some are in person, some are done over Zoom, and some are just, do whenever you want through Blackboard or whatever the, yeah. you know, uh, Blackboard still thing. Is. That's funny. Uh, yeah. yeah. We don't use Blackboard, okay. but uh, we use something called Canvas, but yeah, Blackboard's still a thing. Yeah. All of those school oriented <laughs> apps tend to be sort of everybody's it's like, how is this the best we could do? <laughs> so I'm not shocked that <laughs> testing is kind of a hodgepodge yeah. of all sorts of different things as well. But mm -hmm. honestly, the, the oscillating 
uh, cohorts of in, in person versus not on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, whatever, Tuesday, it actually seems sort of reasonable to me that, that, that I am mm-hmm. picturing in my head, I think I could be comfortable with, huh? Are you, are you grateful yeah. that you're at the tail end of college and you're just ready to be done with it and get out? Yes. Or are, are you kind of feeling like you're missing any, any milestones of like, you wish maybe you could come back and make up your senior year in like two years? I, I, I feel that way about my junior year because like junior years kind of are, are the spring semesters where we have a lot more of our events. There's a lot more like traditions uh-huh. that go on in events in the spring. And so kind of like breaking at spring break and then not coming back kind of like took some of that away. Um, but I they've figured enough ways around things to do senior year and still have a lot of the big events. So like we have a thing where each class will get together or, well, you know, people who decide to do it will do something called stunt night where they basically do a theme skit um, for each grade level. And this year to make it work, they did it in our stadium with like socially distant seating and like reserve seats and all that. So they're, and they're live streaming. So like they're, they're finding ways to accommodate within that. But I'm actually going for a master's right after this. So uh, you got, you got tons <laughs> of time left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I got, I got plenty of time to load. Is that a uh, business classes. master's? Yeah. No, so I'll actually be going for a Master's of Divinity. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, yeah. I may go back for an MBA later. I'm considering it, but it's more like, eh, if my field and, you know, the desire is there, um, sure. But if not, if I don't get really a concentration with an MBA, it's just another year and a half of general business education. Okay, gotcha. And yeah. what does the, you know, Master's in Divinity imply? Would you, I feel like I had a, a friend of mine, I don't know what his master's was. He is a, an ordained minister of, of some kind now, but I think he actually worked at a ABC store for a long time. She's like a checkout clerk. And then he's like a youth <laughs> pastor. He's like a checkout clerk at an ABC store and yeah. a youth pastor. And I'm like, huh. But I don't know if yeah. he actually studied, like got a master's in divinity. Does that kind of set you up yeah. for working in, in your so, church? Is that, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So there's a few different degrees in like that room you can get. There's the MTS, which is a master's theological studies. That's for kind of like the people who want to lead, but like aren't going to be a pastor or minister. Um, the MDiv is kind of like the MBA or the MBA of the religious world. So it's more of like, if you want to be like, you know, the head pastor at a bigger church, things like that gives you more general or general, but also deeper knowledge. And then you can also get what's called the MACM, the Masters of Christian Art Ministry. That's kind of more like the educational ministry degree. And so, yeah, there's, there's a variety. Do people ever major in something like that purely for the historical exposure? (laughs) <laughs> like I, there must uh, be a ton of history, but is it, or is it more yeah, like, just, I don't know, theology? Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely, um, people who do go that route. Um, so like in our undergrad program, we have a, well, we used to, I don't, we don't actually have anymore. We have a church history major, which you could take, okay. but I think there was like two people that took that and it's history. So it's, it's whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, some people definitely do do it for like the more interesting aspect, like the historical aspect. But generally, if they're doing that, they're going more for the MTS, which is a two-year program, whereas the MDiv is a four-year program. Gotcha. It's more of like a you've you've got to be committed to want to do the MDiv program because it's just it's a lot more work. Hmm. It's a lot more work. And you think you'll stick around in Texas? Yeah, that that's the plan. I uh, I kind of want to stay. I I've really kind of found a home here in Central Texas. I kind of want to stay here for another few years, at least through grad school, because I want to go to grad school at Baylor and Waco. So kind of still, still stay in the same area. After that, sky's the limit. But I, I, I'm comfortable in Texas. I like Texas. I wouldn't be opposed to moving, but I like Texas. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, my sister's a big yeah. fan. Uh, she's been there now probably <laughs> five years, and they just had their first kid. So I have a feeling. Aww. Yeah, it seems like Austin in particular has had you know at least a decade now of pretty rapid growth and hasn't completely killed the the place like people still love love it there it seems like i'm sure yeah. maybe some really you know uh born and raised people there maybe aren't so happy with how it looks now just in terms but uh kate really loves it yeah she's and her husband uh kate is my sister i don't know if i mentioned that yeah but, yeah it's it's tempting and actually one of my best friends moved to uh, san antonio so it's like uh, everyone mm. i know is slowly migrating to texas i'm like what's up with that i can't yeah. deal with the heat so yeah. i'm not i'm not about to move there. <laughs> yeah it's the way it is you're too north you're too it's too cold where you live for me like it's it was like 37 overnight here and i hate yeah. it yeah i i love the heat but see i like the density of cities like i can get to mm. like four or five other huge metropolitan cities that are totally separate from one another 
uh, personality wise, character wise, and all that. You know, Philly is very different from New York, which is very different from Baltimore, very different from DC, all within like a three hour orbit of one another. And I feel like, yeah. you know, Texas, other than San Antonio and Austin, sort of like not much else. Uh, Houston, which yeah. I'd never really, Houston was fine. I haven't spent enough time there. <laughs> he, he, I, I think Houston's the worst big city in Texas, but that's just yeah. my opinion. And Dallas is also trash, but that's just, uh, <laughs> Well, I actually <laughs> loved Dallas. My only, my, oh, my exposure to it though was probably tainted, not tainted, uh, weird because it was just when the scooter companies had launched a couple of years back. And hmm. so I okay. was able to see the entirety of downtown Dallas in like 30 seconds by scooting around the entire thing, <laughs> which is cool. I got to see a lot of really cool like art shops and I don't know. I don't know how to describe some of the neighborhoods that I discovered, but it was one of the, and it was so nice out like weather and temperature wise scooters and flat like scooters were ideal for that type of place. But uh, yeah. you know, maybe it was more about the scooting than actual Dallas <laughs> that I am remembering. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see, you know, over time, if you uh, end up doing more, more or less weddings, uh, yeah, as you kind of venture out into all these other things, uh, especially yeah. Divinity School, that I'd imagine is going to be pretty time consuming. But yeah. 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 Is most of your wedding work yeah. uh, for weddings, do you, do you, you do operate under your own actual business name? For some, yeah. Or, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Do most yeah. of the clients just come through like word of mouth? Is that what you said? Yeah, most of word of mouth. Um, so part of what I did when I came to college was there's kind of two routes you could take to kind of get known for having a camera. You could either work at all the like different committees that like form for like student events and things sure. like that. Yeah. I chose the route. I ended up working for the university yearbook for three years. So I got paid to do what I was doing and everyone knew me. So it kind of helped establish that up. Yeah. Um, and then I, I quit this year cause I wasn't going to do it again. Um, the start of it, <laughs> yeah. but, um, yeah, so I kind of took that approach. And so that, and then my prior, um, experience at the camp that I used to work at, I ended up running the, um, photography team there mm -hmm. my last two years that I was there. So I took three years off between high school and college and worked, um, worked that out to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And so just kind of all of that background just kind of pushed it to where when I finally launched a business, everyone was like, Oh, Finally. Yeah. It and makes so sense. It right. Was, yeah. You know, it's yeah. funny too, because as soon as you, I don't know exactly how old you are, but like, it seems like right after college, you do get this huge rise and a lot of people in your social circles, they start to get married. Uh, especially there's like mm -hmm. a huge wave right after college and then it sort of tapers off. And then there's another big wave, like three or four years after that. And yeah, you're well positioned, hopefully, to take advantage of that as long as you're not too busy working with your degree. Uh, yeah, yeah. Keep... that that that's been the plan since day one. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Coming in, I knew that was going to happen, so I I kind of set myself up for that. And I'm actually doing six friends' weddings next year. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm pr I'm probably going to get. You're going to drop out of school. You're engaged. going to be knee. <laughs> you're going to be neck deep in this, and you know, uh, running your own Patreon and launching your own workshops. Uh, point. You got. You're getting in early, man. I, I didn't shoot a single wedding until yeah. maybe three years after college, something like that. And there was a, a girl mm. named Caitlin James who started around her junior year, and she's she's big time. She's huge. And she's been uh, yeah you know, incredibly successful. Like there's me and there's her as like really well established wedding photographers, and nobody. Mm -hmm from our graduating class hires me. They all hire her and everybody else. <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. I'm, I'm very aware of Caitlin James. Oh. She's also kind of popular in the light and airy circles. And so okay. people in our courses are recommending this person or Caitlin James. It's just, yeah. Yes. But yeah, no, I I'm down. I, I want to see where like life takes me and, I'm I'm open to doing this full time if that's the direction I end up going. Um, I actually want to use some of my video skills to work with nonprofits um, because a lot of I, I've been doing some work for my church. Like we partner with a lot of different people in the community, and so we're trying to help tell their stories so more people can hear about them. And one of them in our area um, is doing like urban farming in a local food desert where there's just not a lot of access to. Um, good quality vegetables and other things like that. And so they were actually going to get partnered with a company to do a documentary on their work because they're like becoming internet, like nationally known for some of their, oh. some of their methods. But then when the company talked with them and they kind of like went back and forth, they were like, yeah, we can do a multi-year documentary for you. It's going to be $5 million. And it's like, nonprofit doesn't have that money. And so I obviously can't do something that scale, but like being able to come alongside like once a quarter or something like that, get updates and like, 
you know, helping tell stories and things like that mm -hmm. is kind of where I also kind of want to help give back in a way. But yeah, I, I, I want to see where it all takes me. I don't, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons I jumped in early. I'm, I'm, so I'm 24. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah so you've got clearly the, the technical foundation, you know, that, that it will enable you to hopefully, I think the key in all this, especially starting, you know, younger, like you are, is, you are you have like the fundamentals the foundations are all well positioned so when an opportunity does arise that really aligns with your passions and goals like you will know what to do with that opportunity so many photographers or you know creatives in general just don't recognize until it's too late what opportunity they had whatever it is sitting in front of them like you it like that's yep. the key is being able to just recognize when it's sitting they're staring you in the face <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. i kind of experienced that a little bit with the the celebrity portraits i was doing at the press club like it took me four years of working there before i realized like oh my gosh why don't i just ask if i can take a portrait of these people the simplest thing but then it seems so obvious in hindsight but like going into it i just didn't realize what i what i could do or not do like i was the new employee and it took me four years and now i yeah. you know i still was able to take advantage of a lot of those celebrities or politicians in, in getting their portraits but i still kick myself for not having thought to do that earlier i just wasn't confident i wasn't you know skilled enough in, in terms of my photography uh, off camera flash work and you know lighting them the way that i ended up doing so yeah, you're well positioned to take advantage of things which is good in the in the good way not like an exploit yeah yeah yeah, yeah I guess but so. you keep mentioning video do you have yeah. a sense of whether your your passions lie more in the still imagery versus video or just equal? i'm 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 definitely a, a photographer before a videographer so i did i directed a broadcasting class in high school for s seven months that was my video experience before i ended up in my church and um I started as a media intern for them and they needed more video work than photo work. So I was like, okay, I jumped in with that. And then we had like within two weeks of me working there, we had um, a live stream station kind of set up in our sound booth, but they wanted to make it more like official. So they changed a couple of like a couple rooms. They knocked the wall down. They built a live stream studio. And the goal was for me to like, to watch the um, media director, like do stuff for a few weeks and like jump in and do some stuff here and there. But the first Sunday I was like, I've run a switcher before I can do this. And so I just kind of fell into it. Now I run our, our video department, but <laughs> I'm definitely photo before I'm definitely photo before video, but it's just, especially with COVID this year, it's just been one of those things that I, I started offering more video services because live stream people need yeah. it. Yeah. 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 People need it. And like I have the skills and it doesn't take much. Like I was working with the photographer that I shoot in San Antonio. I was there telling her about wanting to do a video, um, for weddings and she was like well you know if you shoot some stuff for me and edit it for me you know i'll pay you a little bit extra and i was like sure i mean i shot maybe five minutes during a portrait session or during the bride and group photos and i mean i knocked that out in 13 minutes when i got back to my computer wow it was all slow-mo yeah yeah it, yeah i yeah. mean it was all 60, it was all 60 fps yeah these beauty shots yeah 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 yeah, yeah. The, i think yeah, i just, think in yeah. the wedding world the videography can be uh commoditized in a way where you just are kind of following a template of a couple key shots yeah. throw it together with some music boom I, I don't see i guess it kind of works the same way depending on how you do your photography i don't do slideshows so it wouldn't really work like that for me at all but yeah, yeah. With video it seems that's the reason why at least in my market here a lot of video studios exist where they're able to outsource to almost anybody who's got the equipment and reasonable knowledge on how to shoot it or how to you know take shots they can outsource the, the raw capture and then edit it into something amazing almost no matter who's shooting it's kind of crazy yeah <laughs> uh, a lot of the work yeah. heavy lifting can be done in editing and i just I feel like there is a fundamental disconnect in photos uh, because you don't have the music to to pull at your emotional strings and when people are looking at their full gallery of 800 photos they're not doing that to music yeah. you know? maybe some yeah. people <laughs> not me yeah yeah i uh yeah, I, I'm aiming to do like maybe one to two minute long highlight videos, mostly cool. like social media or Instagram real kind of like focused content rather than like, you know, five minute wedding videos with like 
you know, toast and speech. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I'm bummed to yeah. see Reels uh, right now being essentially like a TikTok clone in terms of not just functionally, yeah. but like the, the actual content is all like lightweight educational stuff that I'm seeing. I don't know, but we're probably living in different worlds because social media algorithms are like that. But it, yeah. I would love to see the Instagram Reels trends and just content matter be something special and distinct to like that platform. I don't know what that looks like, yeah. but maybe something more polished and super pro. But right now it seems like everybody who gets a uh, decent interaction, it's like lightweight kind of BTS stuff, uh, which is fine. Uh, yeah. It's cool. I mean, that's what I've also put out myself just to like play around. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. the big thing for yeah. me relate as it relates to video is the audio component of it is such a wild card. And it is such a, I feel like mm. a headache when you're trying to work on the day to like get battery charged, get people mic'd up, you know, not have a wind issue or a connection from the DJ music issue or whatever. Mm. <laughs> It's just so many yeah. things that can go wrong in audio along with everything else. It doesn't leave a lot of headroom for truly pushing yourself creatively, you know, with composition and, and lighting. Yeah. That's why I, I don't want to do any audio in my videos. Just slow-mo. Oh, it is literally just slow-mo and sound. Okay. Yeah. That does oh, yeah, that, that frees yeah. up a lot of that. You know, for people who want video, but don't want to hire a full video team or things like that, um, kind of adopted the approach from Taylor Jackson. His Patreon talks a whole lot about that. Um, and it's just, you know, shooting an extra three gigs at a wedding and increasing the pay already there. Because mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where I'm at right now cause, because I'm still younger in the industry and my connections aren't as deep and long um, and the people that are hiring me are straight out of college students or things like that. I'm definitely pricing under my market for what I know my skills are worth, but I'm upselling it in a way to try and match what I could be getting. Yeah, that's a good approach. Uh, I'm working my way into Yeah, that's yeah. a great approach. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I mean, it takes at least, I'd say, a solid three years of working healthy part-time, if not full-time, concurrent with everything else you do in your studies before you know you can really have the established word-of-mouth audiences and all of that to charge you know, starting what you're uh, upselling yourself up to now, <laughs> but also every yeah. market's different. So, you know, whatever Taylor, yeah. Taylor Jackson does in Canada is going to be very different than what the reality is in Texas. I'm guessing <laughs> at the yeah. end of the day. <laughs> in, in yeah. terms of the financials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Well, I, I actually did want to ask, I have your, you, you were, I think the only person that seemed to get exactly what I was oh. laying <laughs> out uh, with the signal flow. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have any questions for me or did I explain it clearly enough? It's just technically you, you, weird that a lot of people yeah. wouldn't get it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, what I was trying to like figure out the framework and then I went back to uh, like the post right before that, when you were like still teasing signal flow and you're, uh, you had the video come out um, when you were editing Federico. I don't remember his name. Federico, um, the Italian guy. Uh, yeah. yeah, when you were uh, editing his images, um, and you said even if you don't have a developed X profile, it'll blend against Adobe Color, and that was like what made it click to uh, me because I was thinking like, what if, like, what if you don't have developed EOS Web like, Utility? Oh, negative yeah, review. I think, I think <laughs> your battery probably died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me go get another battery. That's yeah. That's cool. <laughs> hmm. There you are. There we go. Hey, buddy. There you are. <laughs> um. Um. Oh my God. What were we even talking about? Something with signal flow and yeah. Signal flow. Oh, shoot. Um, you were saying the I think blending with Adobe color clicked and then what else? I, I think knowing that I had like messed around with the, your, um, Instagram, uh, what do you call them? The Instagram filters yes. and learning how to build a lot for that. So, um, knowing that like that helped, because I knew if I didn't know that I wouldn't have understood the process of how your LUT was comparing back and forth. Yep. Um, so that like having played with that, that helped a whole you lot. You know, I almost, I think um, I need to get like a graphic that has like develop X, uh, your, all your other edits, basic panel, tone curve, all that. And then like bit mm -hmm. depth wedged in between there. Cause that's, oh no, your battery <laughs> or something. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Oh, this is going to be a man. podcast ultimately anyway. So it's, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I, I can probably, can I switch to my other webcam? Oh, uh, probably. Yeah. I think you should be able to, there should be a, an hmm. array of options at the bottom of the, uh, there's this. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's clicked in your head. Any, any, uh, outside questions about it? Cause it's actually going to be released for patrons pretty soon. I think it, maybe even tomorrow I'm still waiting on hmm. the, the okay. final stuff from 
from the developed guys? Um, gosh, outside questions. I, I guess mostly what I'm curious about is like the process of how you figure like the reinterpretation algorithm of like what, how you settled on, you know, input X for output Y like that's like that, yeah. I guess is what I can't wrap my mind around because I, like, mathematical I, expressions I it's mathematical yeah. expressions using raw footage from the r5 specifically in uh, davinci resolve so there's a there's a tab in davinci resolve called fusion which i think is mostly used for really advanced like cg type work yeah but you mm -hmm. can you can input your own mathematical expressions and manipulate the data almost at like the pixel level through that and um, yeah i'm thinking about making a tutorial for it but i don't think there's going to be anything reasonably shorter than a <laughs> lot of hours to explain the actual yeah. i mean, like maybe i'll make a high level this is how you can do it but you're going to need to learn a lot in terms of uh, like math and mathematical equations <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but I at the end of like math <laughs> yeah i really don't but uh <laughs> But the thing is, you can take starting point equations and kind of like make adjustments from there, subtle adjustments, you know, just playing around with the numbers and still get yeah. an interesting manipulation that is many layers underneath sort of what you could previously do. Uh, and then you can just capture that interpretation as a LUT and, and implement it anywhere. Uh, a LUT is just a give me this value, I'm going to output this one relative to the standard that is the neutral 512, you know, uh, array of colors and tones. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that that's it. So it's still totally subjective. Like what I'm doing could still yeah. look crappy to somebody. It's not like, <laughs> but yeah. but it is a new look that is uh, unique to what you were able to output before in Lightroom, which I'm incredibly happy with pers personally. Like as as a look that i've developed but you know over the over the past year it's tr it's moved a lot like the the goalposts have uh, developed as my eye has if I, as i've played with different outputs and i have no doubt that even in months later as i see other people edit with signal flow and make their own changes and output i'll be i'll, I'll realize things that i'm not seeing in my own work right now having mm -hmm. just played with it myself and even with me editing other people's work but um it is a fundamentally new way of editing that you're right really clicked for me personally back when i was playing around with instagram's filters and you know a lot of photographers i think don't or creative people in general maybe get a little too apprehensive about the technical aspects of some new thing and don't appreciate that it will totally inform something later on it may have nothing to do with using an instagram filter for you know whatever reason that was just kind of a pr fun project but that laid yeah. the foundation for real realizing in my mind like oh this is how this is usable in lightroom to make an entirely different thing that i never would have been aware of and you know it's, I don't know that I was aware of what a, a LUT even was until like end of last year, just because I do almost no video that's not talking at the camera. Oh no, you're frozen again. Yeah. Oh, you're back. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So if you do have any questions, feel free to let me know because you at least understood after maybe those two posts exactly fun, like conceptually how everything was, was going. It's really hard to explain to people that know yeah. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I only knew what a LUT was because I had been color grading video footage for a couple of years. That's the only reason I knew. But I, I guess I didn't even understand, like, fundamentally putting a LUT in was like a reinterpretation of color. I had never approached it that way. I was just, this is the quickest way to start a color grade to get this look. I viewed, in my mind, a LUT as like a preset, um, which I guess in some ways it is, but it's interpreting through a different level of, you know, colors. But that's how yeah. I had always viewed it. Um, and, yeah, that's just... Yeah, it's such a new concept that I, I can't really wrap my brain around it. Like, fundamentally, I understand what you're doing here, but it's definitely one of those, like, I wish I had questions, because, but I don't. <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. Uh, I, yeah. But, you know, maybe once uh, you start to actually use it, uh, it can be. Yeah. The other thing that I'm really excited about, and it didn't even click in my head until a couple weeks ago, was that like so many photographers have an established look at this point where they've purchased enough presets where it changes your tone curve and your HSL sliders and, and your white balance or whatever to something that is cool and you've probably modified whatever presets you've purchased before to look 
exactly how you want. But mm -hmm. what's neat is what I did in the Federica video. Uh, again, this may benefit you, it may not, but it fundamentally changes the output in a way that wasn't previously able to be tapped into in Lightroom to just to keep your preset exactly the same and just switch up the, the camera calibration profile to be what I might call bit depth. Um, and or I think Adobe calls them creative profiles. Yeah. Uh, whatever. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, but like swapping that out creates a, a fundamental change below all your other edits that I think gives things a, a really awesome look. And there's sort of two ends of that equation. There's what I just outlined, but there's also what I include in signal flow as well. The kind of out, out printing your, you know, committing to your edit as a JPEG and then editing on top of the JPEG file to get even yeah. a, a different look from there that I find really pleasing. <laughs> so yeah. it's, yeah, so many yeah, layers. You're, yeah, you're insane. <laughs> like, yeah, like but when you came up, mm -hmm. yeah, when you came up with uh, talking about mastering, I think it was this year, it may have been last year, I don't know, it, this year is a blur. Um, when you were talking about mastering, I remember thinking, why are you editing a JPEG? But then I did a handful of times myself and I was like, it really is enabling like a different look than you would have gotten it, it's really like you said you talk about it a lot like that like little five percent kind of things that add up to what your look ends up being absolutely when you change you know that's why i like going back as far as i possibly can even if it's not like a drastic huge overhaul at that level when you when you add that a slight change as far back in the the layers and the process as you can as close to the pixel level as you can possibly manage without you know trying to write your own uh, whatever uh yeah. yeah it all adds up to just a fundamentally different look that hopefully uh brings you and people actually like and whatever at the end of the day it's also subjective and you have to use your own measure oh, yeah. of taste and develop your own style in a way that people like <laughs> or at least you're personally happy with um but yeah it's it's crazy to me if nothing else just how things tend to look when you start manipulating the jpegs my big thing is coming up with a workflow that's still efficient it really sucks that there's no way to export i mean there is but there's no way to export a high resolution smart preview as a jpeg and then manipulate that somehow because yeah. i i love working from smart previews it's so lightweight and quick but the mm -hmm. Uh, you, having to be connected to a raw file in order to do a JPEG export, then re-import mm -hmm. and then master it. It's like, uh, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. That was the thing that stopped me from doing it was that I, I think I set up, I don't even remember if you probably talked about your video on mastering. Um, I set up a folder action to like re-import them on top of the yeah. um, raw files and then re-export. But it was just, I mean, that's two full round trips. And then I'm storing the JPEG files as well. And it's just, it's it's a yeah. bit of a mess. My hope is that someday Lightroom will let you uh, establish the size of the smart preview file because right now I think it's always at like twenty five hundred pixels wide. The yeah. DMG smart preview. It'd be great if they would let you do something full res, but it just is attached and embedded in the smart previews catalog. And I don't know something like that could work. Who knows? Yeah. But, but uh, that's what's cool about if you swap things out on the creative profile level, the, the profile calibration camera, whatever, camera calibration profile, <laughs> um, you, you, you do get, a, you're tapping into a similar vibe. It's not quite as extreme as editing the JPEG, but it is giving it a refinement and a new look that was previously, again, not accessible in, in Lightroom. So yeah. anyway, I appreciate your, your feedback. I'm glad it clicked for you. Again, you were like yeah. the only one that was like, is this what you're trying to say? I was like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry I couldn't get it down two sentences for you i, I sat yeah. there at my phone i was like there's guy i i i can't summarize it's, it any better it's tough yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah but that's okay that means you know a lot of people this is an important thing to start to push as, a, as an idea just out there into the yeah. world because a lot of photographers aren't taking advantage of it and again the technical aspects of it can be a little intimidating it's not that difficult once you actually like build one beginning to end you're like oh I can do that. But yeah. when you're starting from absolute scratch from somebody who has only purchased presets that just change stuff in the basics panel and all that, it can be mm -hmm. a little intimidating. So anyway, I'm going to keep pushing it, but <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it gets marketed and uh, yeah. how it ends up because yeah, it's one of those things, like you said, the new technology, people don't take advantage of it, but also they just don't understand it. And so it's like, yeah. 
And there's still things I don't understand about a lot of stuff. And, and, and there's weird limitations and exceptions just purely based on how Adobe operates. Like they do so many w things that are just weird because they're a huge company that has a lot of legacy code that, and with that comes a lot of bloat. And so they have to do things in like a kind of patchwork, uh, way sometimes it's just, it doesn't make sense, yeah. but anyway, um, all right. <laughs> well, I, Hey, I really appreciate you talking with me. I don't know if there's yeah, anything else sure. you, uh, you want to uh, chat about, but I uh, have another camera at my doorstep. I want to go unpack and play with. So <laughs> I say the only question I have left, and this is probably a more Patreon focused question, but yeah. when are you going to break down that, that exposure series you did, um, where people were split off? I, I, I still think it's a multiple exposure panorama, but I don't know that for sure. Oh yeah. That's it's my... totally multiple exposure. You're, you're get, heading in the right direction. Um, I just want, I keep forgetting to do it at other weddings, but I want like, <laughs> yeah. I, I want that to be very associated, um, in like in my, or I want it to be uh, like present in my portfolio a little bit more. Mm, I gotcha. like prisming was the same thing. Like I shot like a year before I blogged about prisming. Same with the ring of fire, like it took almost two years before I have ever really broke that down. And like, uh, here's how you do it. Um, so eventually sense, it, yeah. it'll happen. Yeah. I just, I need more. <laughs> I've only got like maybe four that I'm happy with, I think total. Gotcha. And I want like 30. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I just yeah. literally forget to do stuff at weddings. And, and, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I saw that. Up. Yeah, that shot with Nessa, where her, I think it was, um, her hand was like in the lamp, but it that I was like, okay. And then you started coming out the weddings. I'm like, okay, I. But that's the thing is, I never practice. I need to practice multiple exposures more. I, I've got the panoramas down. I just don't have the multiple exposures down, and I, I forget about it at weddings. I just well, that's I, I try and push. I mean, you're probably sick of hearing it at this point with the deconstructions. <laughs> the the yeah. you know, at a at a basic minimum, get high contrast photos, just a couple, as simple as a silhouette, and and then worry about the multiple exposure, the the second exposure later on if you if you can't bring yourself to remember or focus the time on the wedding day just like yeah. get that initial silhouette and then play around with that same memory card in your camera for the second shot later in the evening or just some other day uh, yeah. like at least get a cool awesome silhouette with the intention of creating the double exposure later or um any type of deep rich black shadow they, the couple doesn't have to be silhouetted it can be any anything where the couple is maybe lit in direct sunlight and the rest of what's around them is in really dark shadow that uh -huh. that's ripe for opportunity to with a second exposure fill that in with some crazy anything you know it can be a yeah. sense of geometry uh, bokeh is often used uh, yeah. flare, whatever uh, but it, it makes yeah. a world of difference to go play that process out in camera uh mentally instead of just doing it in post using photoshop or something because i don't know it, first of all it's easier to edit you get a more consistent edit working with the raw okay. files but um anyway yeah uh so the answer is i don't know yeah. <laughs> i don't know yeah. when i'll when i'll post something but it'll it'll yeah. come eventually yeah yeah what drew me to your multiple exposure work was there was this photo you post i i I was digging for like an hour last week trying to find the uh, photo. It was the photo you took. It was a, it was not the day night multiple exposure, but it was one like that where you had the slits with the couple in day and night. And I remember seeing that. I was like, I don't even know how this is possible. And then as I've like gone on through your Patreon more, like I completely understand how it works. Now it's just one yeah. of those. I saw that shot and I'm like, I have, like I have to do that. Like I, I have to. <laughs> but I just, I just not top of my mind. But I need to make yeah. more of a push to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll get there. I'm excited to, to see, uh, I'm getting even more warnings now from your connection. So this is probably a good time to sign off. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I lost All your right. face. Um, anyway, thank you so much for talking with you. Uh, what yeah, is your sure. Instagram? Do you want to spell it out for people? Just to, I'll, yeah. I'll link it in the notes, but just so people have it. So my Instagram is Steven S T E V E N Neavis N E A V E S media M E D I A. Um, yeah, you can follow me there. Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate it. Bye. Cool. Bye.